Recorded live. Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. Many of us as we're out there in the world today, when we see mishap and mayhem, try to figure out ways that we can bring many changes to the world so that we can find a better place to live. But as many of us stand around and we talk about it, waiting for somebody else to step out on the dance floor, Beyond 50 likes to bring those stories to you that show people who are actually doing it. Perhaps sometimes when you take a look at the change that you want to create, you figure the problem is so awesomely big that you just don't think that you can get started and make a difference. Well, imagine starting with just $25 and being able to, able to create change around the world, to the tune of more than 200 schools, that is. The book is Pencils of Promise, and joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is New York Times bestselling author and the founder of Pencils of Promise, which is an award-winning organization that has broken ground, as I mentioned, on more than 200 schools around the world. I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today our guest, Mr. Adam Braun. Adam, how are you today? I'm doing well. How are you? Doing well. Now, tell us how this all started for you. I mean, you seem to be on a fast track toward Wall Street, but all of a sudden that just didn't seem to be the direction that you wanted to be in. Tell us about that. Correct. Uh, and one just quick clarification. So the book is actually called The Promise of a Pencil, although it sounds similar to Pencils of Promise. So, um, you know, I actually I grew up outside of New York City uh, when I was about 13, I opened up an E-Trade account when I was uh, 16. I started working at a hedge fund, and when I was 19, I was working at a fund of funds and was essentially on a fast track to a Wall Street career. And uh, when I was about 20, 21, I I saw this film that was shot in 24 different countries around the world and just became really impassioned about seeing these places with my own eyes. And so I joined a program called Semester at Sea uh, as a junior in college, and I had a habit of asking one child in each of the countries that we went through a very simple question which was, if you could have anything in the world, what would you want most? And I would ask it to one kid in each country, and I expected to hear uh, the things that I wanted, which was uh, everything from you know, a house to a boat or a car, just some type of material possession. And um, when I got to India, where the poverty was more devastating than anything I had ever seen in my life, uh, I asked one boy who was begging on the streets, and I, uh, I asked him if he could have anything in the world, what would he want? And his answer, much to my surprise, was, a pencil, uh, nothing more, nothing less, just a pencil. And I gave him mine. He just lit up. I, you know, truly never seen uh, anything like that. And I realized that this boy had actually never been to school before in his life. And that even as a young person without much money or fame or influence, I could find a meaningful way to impact um, his life through a small act. And that uh, kind of catalyzed what eventually became this mission around creating access to education for all. And I found myself at. Um, you know, great job, uh, you know, great friends, great life kind of in New York City at the age of 23, 24. Uh, I was working at a gaming company, a leading consulting firm. And on paper, kind of had everything that I was supposed to want at that point in my life. Um, and, uh, you know, was on my way to a six-figure job. And at the same time, I just didn't have the sense of fulfillment that I wanted. Uh, and I wasn't fulfilling a sense of uh, personal purpose either. And so I just got this idea, um, because I'd always passed out these pencils, to start an organization called Pencils of Promise. Um, And the ambition was to just build one school and dedicate it to my grandmother, who was turning 80. And um, I asked friends to give donations instead of birthday presents that year. And and off of that, uh, uh, this meant, uh, I would say, excitement around trying to create an organization that was run with the head of a for-profit business and the heart of a, a nonprofit humanitarian mission. And uh, next thing I knew, you know, the organization started to grow, great people started to surround it, and you know, I just applied all these different beliefs that I share throughout the book about how any person can build something of meaning and merit. And, and the book is really not only kind of showing how I did it, but much more importantly, it's, it, it's, it's illustrated through the steps that every other person can take, and it's broken down into 30 short chapters each of which is titled with a mantra. And those mantras are collectively the guiding steps to a life of success and significance. And uh, so that is the book, The Promise of a Pencil. And um, it tells the story of going from $25 to now 200 schools around the world through this organization, Pencils of Promise. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting because you really come from an affluent background. Is that correct? Uh, I mean, I think it depends on your relative standards. Yeah, it always does, doesn't it? I would say my, my family was... Uh, 
uh, my parents came from absolute poverty, and they got us to a place where we had a comfortable upbringing. I would definitely say that's for sure. Okay, because the reason is, is at the same time that they instilled the value of not feeling entitled. And, yeah. you know, when you take a look at that and you look at America today and you take a look at the fact that we have such a, a ridiculous dropout rate, you know, as far as education goes, you realize that something given for free, so to speak, you know, tends to be taken for granted and there's a sense of entitlement, well, maybe I don't want it now, but I'll go back and get it later. Whereas in other countries around the world, as you said, education is something most of these people, it's just foreign, like, well, what, what is this? And you realize the hunger when the opportunity is being provided for something like that. It must have been an incredible change for you to see something like that in other countries. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I you know, I think that, uh, you know, there's a great Marcel Proust quote that says uh, something to the effect of um, the real voyage of discovery is not in seeing new lands, but in returning home with new eyes. And I think that really happened to me. I mean, you know, you think about. The, the culture shock that you're going to experience going to all these countries. And when I got back, everyone said, you know, what's the biggest culture shock? And there was no doubt in my mind it was actually returning to the States. Um, you know, it just, it just kind of opened my eyes to how the rest of the world lives. And um, within that, just uh, it, it forced me to acknowledge how privileged every single one of us is um, just by virtue of having access to the things that we have in this country um, and made me really impassioned about uh, trying to create a world with true educational quality for all children, regardless of where they're born. And that's what led to the organization eventually. Now, were there other programs that you encountered that were trying to bring the same kind of light to these countries as far as education is concerned as you were embarking on your journey? Um, was there other organizations? Yeah, I mean, I spent a fair amount of time um, with an organization called the Cambodian Children's Fund in particular. I just uh, met their founder, was really inspired by him, and I think a lot of times people think that they have to go off and create things themselves, but I would really encourage anybody else to, you know, first find an organization or a leader that you really believe in and try and, you know, participate in their work and learn from them. Uh, that's what I did. I, I spent, you know, years participating in the Cambodian Children's Fund, just understanding how great organizations were built. I also obviously worked at Bain for a while to see how great Fortune 500 companies were run, and um, you know, I, the thing that I learned from the, the CCF was just the importance of local staff and investment in local sustainability. That it, you know, it can't be Westerners showing up and dropping off gifts and then patting themselves on the back. It really has to be about putting the power in the hands of local populations and enabling them to self-educate. Now, what was that process like as you began to <clears throat> do this uh, in these different countries as far as the local people were concerned? Did they really want to chip in, or did you feel sometimes that you just weren't doing enough or they were giving you that feeling of not doing enough? Um, you know, I think uh, if you pick the right places and you approach it with the right intent, then you find that uh, you meet active partners along the way. So a big part of our approach is that as I mentioned, we don't think of this as handouts. It's not gifts. It's up to these local communities to own and sustain their own projects. So every single school that we build is in partnership with the local education ministry. And almost 20% of the funding, we targeted 10 to 20% early on. Now it's almost always around 20% of the actual funding for the school comes from the community itself. And if they're not willing to provide that 20% contribution, we just don't work there. Mm -hmm. uh, now, these people are often living on, uh, you know, between one and let's say four or five dollars a day, so they don't have extra money um, to spend on their kid's school uh, to help build it. They can't put up the, you know, $2,500 or $5,000 as a community. So what they do is they make up their contribution through materials and labor, which is perfect uh, in our eyes because we want them physically building their own schools because then if there's issues down the line, things start to break down. They're not going to say, hey, where was that Westerner who built my school? Get them back here. They're going to say, no, 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 we put in the labor, we built this, we have the skills, and now we're going to go fix it. Yeah, because that tends to be the problem at times where you see someone who goes into a place to make a difference, and they put in all their time and their sweat mm -hmm. and their equity and so forth, and everybody stands around and says, well, is there more that you're going to be able to do here as they stand around and nobody actively participates? <laughs> you know? right, and right, I can right. see how you actually get these people to have a stake in what's going on here because, you know, Completely. once the building is built, once the education is started, you know, that's just the beginning. You know, they're exactly. seeing it through. Exactly. I mean, you're talking about a quarter of a billion children who lack a basic education. <laughs> right, right. I mean, the <laughs> There's a lot of follow-through going on there. Yeah, the, the school is really just the tip of the, the sword in a lot of ways. I mean, it gets us to identify the communities that are going to co-invest with us. 
but uh, it's really kind of entry, and it's also uh, a way for us to almost see, all right, how does this community operate? How do we get to know these people? And then the real work actually starts once the school is open. I kind of wondered, too, as you began this, you know, when we tend to see something that's maybe bigger than ourselves, we have enthusiasm, we have excitement, we're certainly inspired to realize, hey, I'm going to move forward on this. But then as the days wane through and you begin to see the bigger picture and then the weeks and then perhaps the months, you realize, wow, I've really bitten off something here. Did you ever get to a yeah. point like that? Yeah, I mean, I think when we, I mean, I felt like we had, uh, accomplished something huge when we broke ground on just one school. You know, that was <laughs> such an insurmountable idea at the time to start with $25 as a 25-year-old. Uh, you know, no money. You also got to keep in mind this is late 2008, early 2009 in New York City. Um, and so Lehman Brothers had just declared bankruptcy. Deutsche Bank had, you know, uh, folded essentially. So it was a really tough economic period. So uh, even more so, there was doubt around the ability to succeed in this endeavor. Um, and so the first school felt like, you know, a big deal. But obviously, as we hit, you know, 50, then 100, now 200, um, you know, the, the accomplishments continue to grow, but the ambition does at the same time. Mm -hmm. Now, what did you experience firsthand in these countries that you put these schools in where you thought to yourself, you know, how come this is happening here when it shouldn't be? You know, a good example of that, for instance, is you take a look at the country of Argentina. It's one of the third largest exporters of oil in the world, but yet there's such incredible poverty from a natural resource that they have down there. And you realize, wait a minute, how come their economy is in the states that it's in, and why isn't somebody doing something about this? Right. I mean, you know, the truth is, at some point you have to decide, okay, how am I going to have my impact? And how is the work that I do going to impact others? And mm -hmm. you know, the, the reality is to be truly, truly impactful at scale, you have to narrow your focus. Uh, you just do, ultimately. And so, um, you know, when I look at a situation like Argentina, I think, gosh, there's obviously a lot of good work that can be done. We as an organization, you know, we focus in um, four countries in particular with a deep focus in three of them. And so that's Laos, Nicaragua, Guatemala, and Ghana. Those are the four where we work. But, you know, at the end of the day, I think if you want to lift a country out of poverty, the only thing that's truly proven from a statistical standpoint is investment in their children's education, and it happens from one generation to the next. Mm -hmm. Now, how has other people stepped into this life that you've presented to these places around the world, uh, been able to help you in this uh, and this endeavor as well. Do you see this ground swelling and it's actually growing? And, and, and oh, actually... immensely, immensely. Okay. I mean, you know, we're an organization that was born out of social media. I was Mark Zuckerberg's year in college, and I was at Brown when he launched Facebook at, at Harvard. So we were basically the, the early beta testers. Um, and so, you know, I've just had um, a different approach from most in that we, we really believe in this value of small contributions adding up. And so we've had over 33,000 people launch personal fundraisers on our website. So if you go to pencilsofpromise.org, there's a, a tab the top that says Take Action. And right there you can launch your own personal fundraiser. We create a custom page for you with your photos, your videos, your story. Uh, and you set very tangible goals, and 100% of that funding goes directly into our programs. So you know, if you wanted to educate one child, it's $25. If you want to train a teacher, it's 500 if you wanted to build a classroom, it's 10000 If you wanted to build and sustain a full school, it's only $25,000. Um, and so at, at that point, you know, it's a very accessible number. We've had 13-year-olds build full schools through fundraising efforts. We've had, you know, 70-year-olds. Um, and so the organization has only been successful because of the, the movement behind it. Mm -hmm. You know, I just have to ask, because you see it so prevalent, you know, in America or perhaps even other developed countries now, the idea of building a school, if you were to do that here in the United States, you would be so entangled in red tape and political exactly. bureaucracy, you would never get anything done. You exactly. know, the kids would be standing there watching the school being built, but they couldn't go into it, you know. What's the yeah. difference between here and these other places? It sounds to me like you're throwing up a school, there's the teachers, and the kids are happily becoming educated, you know, almost immediately, it seems. What, what, what is it really like? Um, you know, I mean, here it's a very challenging environment. I looked into working in the domestic education space. It's just really, really tough. Um, you know, as you mentioned, there's a lot of red tape. There's uh, bureaucracy. There's entrenched interest between labor unions, teacher unions, et cetera. Um, where we work, there tends to be rapid adoption. I mean, there's still 
the challenges of you know local governments, and sometimes you run into a person that puts an obstacle in front of you. But the truth is, when it comes to the communities, almost any form of greater education opportunity is embraced, mm -hmm. especially if they start to see results around it. And we have amazing results around our work. Um, and so for us, uh, you know, there's a lot of obstacles early on, but because we hire almost entirely local staff, uh, it makes the, the adoption process much faster, and it's cheaper, and we can do it at scale. Now, Adam, what do you think has been the biggest challenge that you've faced in putting all this together and moving forward? Uh, the biggest challenge. Um, I would say the biggest challenge has been, um, you know, just overcoming the expectation that people didn't think this was poss uh, possible at all. I just heard the word, it's impossible, so many times. Um, and, you know, uh, eventually it almost kind of emboldens you. Uh, it almost gives you strength every time that somebody says, that can't be done. Uh, and so, you know, hearing no 99 times uh, and <laughs> waiting for that one yes is definitely a challenge. But I think for a lot of you know, entrepreneurs or just individuals who, who like overcoming adversity, um, they celebrate those small wins uh, in such big ways that it's all worth it. Mm -hmm. I remember when we started our radio program more than 10 years ago, there was a uh, very prominent politician back in the day who was on the program, and then he decides afterwards to mention the fact. He says, you know, 99% of all radio shows fail within the first year to five years. Mm -hmm. And I just looked at him and I said, well, that's okay. We'll be the 1%. Yep, exactly. <laughs> you know, I and the like bottom that. line, it isn't a, ma a matter of, you know, playing around the statistics. It's, you know, that failure only comes when you decide to quit. You know, it's really just that simple, and you never know as you keep taking that step forward to do what you're very impassioned to doing, just how much those ripple effects over time start building and reverbing back to a change where you're even standing beside yourself saying, wow, I can't believe it really went this far. There must be times that you're kind of stepping back thinking to yourself, you know, this is really starting to catch fire here and, and you know, and just kind of continue with the momentum, and that's the big thing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you, you know, I think that there's something to be said about um, – creating a philosophy and a feeling that you're part of a winning team. I think it's how you attract talent. I think it's how you retain good people. And I think it's how you draw in the right types of supporters for an organization like ours. But at the same time, it has to be balanced with the right humility uh, and the ability to say, look, we're, we don't have the answers. We're going to fail consistently. And if we're not failing, then we're not kind of going big enough. We're not trying new things. We're not trying to be innovative enough. Um, but, you know, what I found along the way was in building this organization, I just learned so much that I wish somebody had told me early on. Um, and I also found that all these people came to me with these kind of same questions. And there was this sense of, of kind of restlessness in certain people. They just reached a point in their lives where they felt like they could either do more or see more, become more, just, you know, kind of uh, get out of what felt like a stagnant place. And that could have been, you know, someone who's graduating college. That could have been somebody who... Uh, you know, was looking to transition their career, uh, somebody whose kids had just become uh, college students and they were now empty nesters and they were trying to figure out what was next. But that's who I wrote the book for. It was, it was for that person who's trying to figure out how do you kind of unlock that inner potential. Um, and I didn't want to just write an inspiring story. I wanted to give them the exact steps. And that, that's the, you know, 30 mantras that title each of the chapters of the book. Uh, it's, it's really the roadmap to follow. What's also uh, interesting to note, too, is sometimes when you give people steps, when you say, okay, look, if this is something you want to do, here's the way to go about it, usually the biggest obstacle is getting started. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah I mean, it, it, <laughs> but I'm sure that the, must have been there for you, like, where do I actually start? I'm given the pencil. What next? <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, I started with $25, and actually the whole uh, introduction to the book, which is a short, you know, two-and-a-half, three-page segment, um, it really just harps on one idea, which is that in order to create anything that grows, you have to start with that first small step. Because I think a lot of people are kind of paralyzed, you know. That there's this sense of paralysis in like, ah, it's such a big thing that I'm trying to take on. I don't even know where to start, and so I'm not going to until I figured it out. But the truth is, I just went to the bank, and I put $25, and I opened up a bank account. And that's how Pop started. Um, and I think that you have to take that first small step. And then incrementally, you take the small steps forward. And then when you look back over the years, you think, wow, we've really come a long way. But it's because you, you know, made a conscious decision to take those incremental steps forward day in and day out. Now, Adam, as you go back to these places where you've started these plantations, so to speak, what kind of change have you seen as a result? 
Oh, it's immense. So, so we spend a lot of time uh, monitoring and evaluating our schools once they're open and working with our community. So we have about 70 international staff, uh, the majority of which is working with communities uh, once uh, schools are opened. And so uh, there's pretty impressive data. I mean, at this point, our students progress from one grade to the next at twice the national average. Uh, when we have our teacher training program in place, uh, our students outperform te uh, peer communities three to one on test scores. And um, the, the thing that we're probably most proud of is that 80%, 85% of our communities, uh, they report increases in literacy. Um, and then rather than 30 to 40% of kids going from primary to secondary school, when we have our scholarship program in place, 96% go from uh, primary to secondary. And I think because of that, uh, we ended up getting awarded the 2013 Education Organization of the Year uh, at a showcase held at the United Nations this past October. I find it interesting. Uh, some time ago, we had attended a performance where there was an African uh, group of children mm -hmm. that would do a tour, and they would do songs and dances, you know, of their nation. Mm -hmm. And it was really touching, you know, very colorful and very, it was just very alive to watch these performances of these children. I think the average age was right around 11 years old, you know, so it was a fairly young group, going down to even as young as six. And it's fascinating to think, okay, you know, here these kids come out of Africa. They go on this traveling tour to, you know, basically show people, you know, dance and song of their nations. And at the end, <clears throat> they each get the opportunity to state what their name is and what they want to be when they grow up. And, of course, overwhelmingly, most of them wanted to be pilots. I think they were just taken back by what it was like to be in a plane, you know, but you think of the simplicity of the inspiration, now there's a possibility that this could happen. Do you experience that with these children? Oh, yeah, immensely. I mean, you know, I've been in slums, you know, in really rough parts of the world. And I'll ask a kid what he wants to be, and he'll say uh, a lawyer. I've heard president, you know, from a kid living in a basically a dumpster um, in uh, Southeast Asia. I, I mean, you know, when you start to unlock a child's potential, it's just incredible how big they're dreams can become, and truthfully, the one thing that can enable it most is education. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just, you know, no doubt in my mind, and that, that's obviously why we work in the space. But, yeah, I mean, it, that's also part of why we uh, have a primarily female staff, because we also want to show to young girls who have never seen the idea of becoming anything other than a seamstress or a farmer that they can go on to become a lawyer or a doctor or a business owner. Sometimes it's just being able to show them the possibility that this actually exists, and hey, if yep. somebody else can do it, so can you. Exactly. Exciting stuff here. The Promise of a Pencil is the name of the book. Adam Braun joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today. Is there a website people can find out more about this and how they can perhaps get involved in their own way? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so uh, they can go to pencilsofpromise.org um, to learn more, to get involved, um, You know, becoming either a monthly contributor, you can become a fundraiser, I mean, you can end up asking for donations instead of birthday gifts and creating a custom page, just like I did from the very start. We've seen those be really successful. And then uh, I continue to write uh, blog posts and updates uh, at adambraun, B-R-A-U-N dot com. Uh, and then I'm on Twitter pretty actively, uh, and it's the ad sign, and then just my name, Adam Braun. Uh, and the book is available at you know, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, uh, and because it um, debuted at number two in the New York Times bestseller list, it's been picked up pretty uh, widely across the nation. Now, Adam, I'm, I'm going to ask, uh, are there other countries you've got your sights on to be able to develop this as well? Or you're pretty much, like you said, having a, a more narrow focus helps you do bigger things? We, we decided to go really uh, deep and narrow, and so we're really focused just on our three core countries, Laos, Ghana, and Guatemala, until 2016. So we want to get to 500 schools, uh, train 1,000 teachers, put 10,000 kids in our scholarship programs uh, by that time. Um, and so it's going to take a lot of support from a lot of people, but I think if we do so, uh, we can be really, really successful um, in demonstrating what the future of education can look like. Well, Adam, I'm certain that you're already successful because unlike a lot of people with big dreams, you got started. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the key. That's the number one thing most people have to do to succeed is just get started, you know and then stick with it. Thank you so much for being on the program with us today. Oh, my pleasure. Again, you can find out more also by visiting us at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. Thank you for joining us. You've been listening to the Beyond 50 Radio program. I'm Daniel Davis, and remember, live your day past halfway.